Hi, I'm Walter Isaacson, and it's a great pleasure, wonderful honor, indeed a thrill, to be with Dr. Jennifer Doudna here at Aspen Ideas Health. It's particularly a thrill because I don't know if she knows this, but it's when I interviewed her at the Aspen Institute a few years ago. I had already tried to figure out how am I going to tackle the new life sciences revolution. And the more I read her book and the more I talked to her, I realized what a wonderful central character. So we owe it to the Aspen Ideas Festival and Health uh, that I've just published a book on Jennifer Downer. So Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me, Walter. Great to be here. Great. Uh, very few aha moments in science, but you had one in 2012 when you, your graduate, uh, your uh, one of your postdocs, Emmanuel Charpentier, and, and other members of the team, suddenly realized you could reprogram a guide in CRISPR to cut DNA where you want it. Explain that aha moment and what you thought might come out of that. Well, the wonderful backstory to CRISPR is that it's it's science that came from from a small scale curiosity-driven project. As you mentioned, it was a collaboration between my laboratory and Emmanuel Charpentier's lab, so an international partnership. And the question we set out to answer was, how is it that bacteria have a programmable system to avoid virus infection? And that line of experimentation led to our, our collaborative work to, to uncover the function of a protein called Cas9 that works like uh, scissors for DNA. And importantly, it can be programmed to find and cut a particular DNA sequence. And when we figured out that molecular mechanism, and this was research done by our lab members, Martin Yinek at Berkeley and Chris Chylinski at Emmanuel's lab, we recognized that this activity could be harnessed for something different in our cells or plant or animal cells, namely, to change the DNA sequence in a programmable fashion. And what health implications has it already had? It's been really exciting, Walter, to see what's happened over the last nine years. It's, uh, it's been amazing to see the CRISPR technology adopted, not only for understanding fundamental gene functions, but as you implied, also for actually changing DNA sequences to correct disease-causing mutations at their source. And so already we've seen advances with sickle cell disease, with eye disorders, liver disorders, and I think in the not too distant future, we're looking for opportunities with diseases like muscular dystrophy, maybe even cystic fibrosis. And so these would be ones with relatively simple single gene mut uh, mutations, right? Yeah, that's correct. That's where CRISPR really excels right now. In the future, it may be possible to make multiple changes in cells at once. But right now, making targeted changes to a single gene is what people are, are focusing on. One of the breathtaking things to me is how many advances have been happening since you and Emmanuel helped create this technology. Uh, when I was at the last CRISPR conference, I'm listening uh, to David Liu, for example, doing things like base editing and prime editing that's moving this forward. How fast is it moving forward? Does it surprise you that we're getting even better and better, sharper tools? Amazing to think about the pace of advances, as you mentioned. I was at a CRISPR meeting maybe two years ago now, and I had the same sense that in the not too distant future, it will be possible to make essentially any edit to DNA in any type of cell using this suite of technologies. And the reason is really the fundamentals of the way CRISPR works, because it works by looking for a DNA sequence, a sequence of letters in all of the vast amount of DNA of a cell and honing in on that one section to make a change. And this is where it's been possible to engineer the technology to do more and more advanced kinds of editing that will essentially ena enable us to do effectively anything in these cells. Uh, there's been great excitement and just everybody's embraced what CRISPR can do in the diseases you've talked about. 
But there was a bit of shock and I think dismay when He Zhuang Qi, who had been to some of the CRISPR conferences you've mentioned in China, did it in a way that was inheritable, I think at the end of 2018. Um, why is that such a, uh, the germ line, such a red line we shouldn't be crossing? And what did you think when you heard about that? What did you do? Well, when I first heard about that, of course, it was it was quite a shock because although many of us, myself included, had been working on understanding how CRISPR might be used in for heritable genome editing, even in humans, we many of us also felt that that was something that should not happen at least yet because of the both the limitations of the technology, making sure that it would actually be possible to do the kind of editing that would be beneficial, but also, of course, all of the ethical implications and societal implications of that kind of editing, which leads to a, a genetic change that would be passed on to future generations. So, of course, when the work that you mentioned was announced at the end of 2018, many people globally were both shocked, but also I think it was a, a wake up moment that we need to come together as an international community and, and take a stand about how the technology will be used in the future. And I think that if there's a silver lining to that story, I think it really is that the international community has been quite actively engaged in discussing and, and not just discussing, but really working on what the criteria should be for using CRISPR in the future. A lot of our family from Aspen Ideas and Aspen Health have been involved, including Peggy Hamburg and yes. uh, obviously David Baltimore and others, um, and uh, Victor Zhao. Uh, what do you think those guidelines should be, and how, how do you feel about this international process? Uh, do you think it's uh, doing a good job at the moment? Well, I certainly think the guidelines should be both about the technical capabilities of CRISPR, but also about the importance of transparency in research and the, and the value of having an international coalition that puts in place criteria for using a technology as powerful as CRISPR. And in my, you know, as you know, Walter, my own personal views about using CRISPR in the human germline have, you know, have changed over the years. I think my, my first reaction when I first thought about this a few years back was we shouldn't go there. And since then, I've come to appreciate that there are some fundamental research questions that could be addressed using CRISPR in very early uh, embryos for under sort of strict research guidelines and conditions. I still feel that today, at least, it should not be used in a clinical setting. In other words, to create a pregnancy with those modified embryos, because frankly, the technology isn't ready yet. And also there hasn't been time for societal consideration. You say your thinking has evolved, and I talk about that in the book, as we both evolve our thinking. And one reason was people would come up to you at conferences afterwards and just tell you about their stories. I want to tell you one of the heart-rending things that's happened since I've published the book is I get 20 or 30 emails a day or people direct messaging me on Twitter showing me pictures of their children or grandchildren and saying, this is their uh, congenital problem. Can you get me in touch with Jennifer or somebody who can save her life? Has that happened to you and how does that affect your thinking? Yes, so that has, has been going on for me actually for a few years, Walter, and it's profound. I mean, I, you know, these, as you said, these, these, these messages and, and the lovely pictures of, of children are just heartrending. And um, they may, you know, certainly for me as a scientist, they make me want to redouble, run back to the lab and, you know, move, move faster, get going more quickly. Um, there's real need out there. I think that uh, it's still really important that the technology, of course, is safe and that it's used ethically. And I try to reply when I get these inquiries, um, honestly, you know, letting people know, look, this is where the technology really is today. Yes, it offers a lot of promise for the future, but frankly, it will still be a while before it's available for this kind of therapy. If it can be safe, if it can be done with no off targets or unintended consequences, uh, what do you think the moral questions that remain are? 
Well, uh, certainly an important one is affordability and access. I mean, I think, you know, for people uh, globally to have the ability to, to gain access to a technology like this, that's, that's critical. And of course, that's going to, a lot of that will come down to price. It can't be a $2 million a patient treatment if we want it to be accessible widely. So that's actually something I'm working on right now at the Innovative Genomics Institute in the Bay Area is to find ways to reduce the cost. We're doing this in a nonprofit organization where we can focus on the ways that we can develop the technology that will, you know, will bring down the cost. Beyond that, I think it's all about understanding genetics well enough that we can make the kinds of edits that we know will be safe and that we feel confident in. So that for some diseases like the ones we discussed earlier, the genetics are well understood. And I think those are, are diseases where we can proceed with confidence, such as for sickle cell disease. But, you know, for disorders like schizophrenia, uh, potentially even, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, very complex genetics. And so there, I think it's gonna take time before we really understand which genes need adjusting. You say you and the IGI have a program to try to reduce the cost. And for example, to cure Victoria Gray last year in Mississippi of sickle cell using the technology that you developed, it did cost $2 million. And part of that is the delivery, taking stem cells in and out of the body. How would you reduce the cost of, of that? Well, I think I and many others are, are uh, looking to a day when for a disease like sickle cell disease, we don't need to do a bone marrow transplant to deliver the genome editing molecules to the cells where they're needed. Imagine that we had a delivery vehicle that could hone in on just those uh, stem cells in bone marrow that need editing and do that efficiently and safely. Right now, that sounds kind of like, uh, you know, science fiction, but I feel strongly that we're on a track right now to figure out a solution to that problem. So that's one uh, path that I think will be very fruitful. And then, you know, for diseases of the brain, you know, delivery, delivering any kind of molecule to the brain is a big, big challenge, but we've made some inroads there as well. So I think that, you know, by focusing on that aspect of genome editing, um, that's certainly one strategy for reducing the cost in the future. One way to really reduce the cost would be to do heritable gene edits to say we're going to edit sickle cell out of the children and uh, that would be much cheaper and much more efficient in the long run. Should that be a consideration when we figure out whether or not we're going to cross the germline? Well, I could certainly imagine a day where uh, for families that have known inheritable diseases where the genetics are well understood and if the technology for editing embryos or germ cells such as sperm or eggs becomes, you know, sort of safe and, and controllable in ways that feel like they could be beneficial in that setting. I think that's a very important consideration um, for the technology. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. And I think, you know, there could be a day, I still think it's probably uh, not for at least 10 years though, when we might say, you know, this is, a, this is the most ethical way to treat or cure a certain disease. Uh, when we talk about crossing the germline, uh, you talk about the issue of the rich being able to buy better genes, perhaps, if you say it's an affordability issue. Do you think that such decisions should be left eventually to the free market? Or do you think there ought to be some social rules that say you can't add height to your children or IQ points just by going to the genetic supermarket? Boy, that's a tough question. I think it's going to be difficult to enforce that kind of thing, quite frankly, both because of uh, global availability of, of health care, uh, but also look at what's happened in in vitro fertilization clinics, even here across the U.S. I think in Different clinics in different states have different allow, you know, allowed uh, manipulations to embryos even now. This is without genome editing. So I think it's going to be challenging to have some kind of global uh, regulation. And it'll probably, frankly, it just will come down to um, 
you know, uh, sort of acceptability, societal accept, uh, acceptability, which is one of the reasons I've really advocated transparency as the technology continues to advance. What are you working on now that excites you in this field? Oh, gosh, many things. Um, we continue to advance the fundamental technology of genome editing. So working with Jillian Banfield at Berkeley, we're uncovering new forms of CRISPR that we think will have advantages for different kinds of applications, as well as just understanding the, the fundamental biology of these pathways in bacteria. And also back to the delivery question, I think figuring out new and better ways to introduce genome editing molecules into tissues in patients is incredibly both interesting scientifically, but certainly very important for the development of the field. If you could uh, deliver in that way CRISPR to certain cells, could it be used in our battle against things like coronavirus rather than us depending on new forms of vaccines every year? Well, for coronavirus and other infectious diseases, I frankly think that at least right now, what CRISPR is best at is use as a diagnostic. That's effectively how it works in nature is as a surveillance mechanism. And so that's how it's being developed currently in addressing the, the uh, ongoing pandemic is to use it as a new way to diagnose disease, even in people that don't have any symptoms. And then, uh, you know, in the future, could it be employed as, a, as a, an antiviral therapy? Various people have, have, you know, thought about this and there are even a few scientific publications about it. However, I do think the challenge does circle back to this issue of delivery. You would need to have the CRISPR molecules in all of the cells uh, that need protection. And I think that's going to be a challenge going forward. Tell me about the detection devices that the company you helped found, Mammoth uh, Biosciences, uh, is, uh, is working on, and how, in general, that might be a platform for more than just fighting the coronavirus or detecting the coronavirus. Right. Well, this is one of the things that I think is very interesting about CRISPR, is that because it's a programmable system, fundamentally, it can be... Uh, deployed for different kinds of infectious agents, detecting different kinds of viruses, for example, and doing that quickly once the, the basic uh, system has been established. So I think in the future, maybe the not too distant future, we will see tests based on CRISPR that are used in a laboratory setting, but also possibly tests that can be used at home or in what we call point of care use, where this is something I'm working on right now in my academic lab and with partners at the IGI is to develop a test that can be used in dormitories, in uh, research buildings like our own at, at the University of California, where we can just give people an opportunity to monitor their health in an ongoing way, inexpensively and accurately. It's been a whirlwind uh, year for you, uh, winning the Nobel Prize with Emmanuel, uh, also turning the attention of uh, your colleagues and yourself to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, let's end with you just reflecting a bit on what you've learned over this past year uh, and what do you think the lasting implications of both the pandemic and this biotech moment we seem to be in is going to have. Gosh, I mean, the pandemic has just been extraordinary, hasn't it? I mean, for everybody and, and just a very, very challenging uh, year. Um, I think for me personally, one of the things that it has taught me is the value of collaboration, of teamwork, of setting aside one's, uh, what you thought your priorities were um, and, and focusing on what really needs to get done in the moment. And that was the decision that we made about a year ago at the IGI was to repurpose our and refocus our efforts on the pandemic. That, that allowed us to quickly set up a clinical testing laboratory, the first ever at the University of California, Berkeley, which doesn't have a medical school. And then, of course, to do all of the associated work that's led to the advancement of CRISPR as a diagnostic approach, um, to uh, working with a number of partner organizations, healthcare uh, groups in the, in the Bay Area community, 
serving our, our firefighters and other, other uh, first responders to provide COVID testing over the past year. It's been an amazing experience. And so I do hope that going forward that we can maintain that feeling of teamwork and look for opportunities to work together, especially it's not something that as academics, we're, we're always comfortable doing, but I think we've all learned, or I certainly have, that you know, there's, there's, you can get a lot done if you, if you pull a team together. Dr. Jennifer Dowd, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for being part of Aspen Ideas Health, which led me on a journey, being your Boswell. And thanks for all you're doing. I guess one thing I hope for is that your story and uh, how scientists such as yourself have reacted to this pandemic will inspire the next generation, just as you were inspired when you first picked up the double helix and said you were going to become a scientist. So thank you. I have the same hope, Walter, and thank you for writing such a, an interesting story about the, the current um, excitement in the biotech world. Great. Thank you very much.